Okay, so I think we're going to move on now to uh, a very good friend, Wayne Mon, who's been coming for about 10 years. A really nice South African, as in the song, and a fantastic magician, but he's a bloody good surgeon as well, so he's going to talk to us. Wayne. Thank you, John. Right, I actually just want to pick up what one of our New Zealand colleagues said there at the back, commenting on, so now you've got an average servant uh, trying one of these techniques. I, uh, I put a presentation together a little while ago, three, four years ago, about my last 10 cases of, of vesicular plasty and then the next 10 with the, elast with the silastic banding and just looked at my results and it's a really small study, I mean it's only 20 patients, but uh, then I, I got a 6.8 decibel improvement average on the following 10. Now you could say well that's just time and experience maybe, but I, I really think that the slightly fixed, uh, more solid connection made a difference in my results. So for an average guy I got about 6.8, so I, th I think it's worth it. You know, we heard four, four decibels is important, so 6.8 I'm, I'm very happy with that. Improvement though, not. Well, Something totally different. I usually talk on far ex advanced otosclerosis at this course, but uh, Robert asked me to speak on something a little bit different. And so, most of the audience, and uh, I, I do see some folk from India and, and maybe some other areas, are coming from a first world country. Well, I come from, and I'm going to be honest, a third world country. Although we like to think that we like to practice first world medicine, unfortunately, South Africa is very much a third world country. And uh, the, this little uh, photograph I actually took 10 days ago in the Kruger Park. So, uh, you know, it's nice to put on someone else's photograph, but I mean, we've got these awesome creatures down there. And uh, just, uh, just to uh, encourage you to come and visit us sometime. So, um, what am I here to talk about? Well, essentially, in, in the first world country, it's, it's, I think you guys have got access not only to a lot of courses and be able to go to temple bone courses and dissection courses, etc., etc., but you also have an incredible training structure. and, and uh, camaraderie and team structure. South Africa works totally different. Unfortunately, our public sector has pretty much imploded, collapsed. We have still one or two very good, well actually three very good universities in terms of otology training, but most of the other universities just don't have the capacity and aren't able to actually train otologists. So I thought I'd quickly show you some, or educate you a bit about Big Five. You've always heard about this Big Five in Africa. All right, so for those that don't know, what are the big five guys in Africa? Well, it's the lion, the leopard, the elephant, the rhinoceros, and the buffalo. And why are they called the big five? Because they're the most dangerous animals to hunt on foot. So that is the reason that you've got the big five. Everybody goes, well, why isn't the giraffe there? Surely that's the biggest. No, well, it's about hunting. Okay, so what are our big five challenges in South Africa? Well, virtually finances is a huge problem there. We've seen now in the government sector that we don't have actually money for prostheses. Now, what you do need to understand is that the private sector and the public sector in South Africa are so different that the public sector operates very much as a first world uh, system, while the public sector is very much a, a dark third world system. So finances are a problem. In the public sector, we, get, we have 54 million people in our country. In the Johannesburg area, we have about four and a half million people, or the Johannesburg city where I work, we get 10 cochlear implants a year from the government. That was last year. This year, there was no budget, unfortunately, we got none. So it's a sad system. However, we do do a lot of implants in the private sector. A lot of uh, companies donate money and raise money, and that's how we're able to continue with our, co our cochlear implant program. But it's sad that our, that our government hasn't seen the benefit yet of cochlear implants. And so that's really where we're coming from. So finance is an issue. Uh, obviously, the education, and I'll talk about that in a little bit while. The politics is always politics, especially in a third world country. You, I'm sure it's on the news every now and again. We have a, a, a president that changes his mind a lot, spends a lot of money on a nice house etc. We're not going to go into all that. Standards, and this has been my biggest sort of uh, bugbear, is trying to maintain standards when you're losing out on equipment, you're losing out on finances, and your education system is, is going down in terms of the otological education. And then obviously your patient care. Can you keep up the patient care? Well, we live in Africa, and things are a little bit different, okay? So what are the objectives of this talk? Well, I, I'll just quickly give you a bit of a difference, and, and we've started that already, of how the third world practices. Can we improvise our surgery safely? Uh, what we can't compromise on? And uh, each area is unique, and it's got its own set of problems. So I'm not here to try and make a political stand. That's not the point. But nothing is impossible if you're flexible. And I've seen that happen in the last five years. I've had to change a lot of my techniques just to be able to suit our new system. So quickly, just remind you about our South African. We've got 54 million people. Eight and a half have
have medical aid or medical insurance, okay? So that leaves us with 45 and a half other million or, you know, people without medical insurance that the public sector needs to look after. Look at this unfortunate statistic. If you look at the 8.5 million lives that are covered in the private sector as opposed to the 45.5 million lives in the public sector, four to one ratio in the private sector. So we have four doctors to one covering eight and a half as opposed to 45 million. So there's huge discrepancies. Uh, I myself am in a private practice. I have an appointment at the, um, not, not an appointment, I, I just do an honorary appointment at our Johannesburg Wits University where I train the otologists. They actually come to my practice just because of the situation that uh, equipment is not always available in theater and uh, I'll, I'll talk about some of those things in the issue. HIV is still a burden in our country, although I must say, given the government's rollout of ARVs a couple of years ago, that is really tapered down and it's become a lot better. But you can imagine the, pub imagine the public sector is overloaded with HIV, TB, and, and we've got a lot of trauma. So these are the, still the three biggest challenges in the country, and that's where a lot of money has been pumped into. So something like autology is seen absolutely as a luxury. Um, we, we've got an interesting tradition, or, or you can say culture in South Africa, that we still have about 70% of Africans consult traditional doctors. I don't know if you have that in your country, but in our country, these traditional doctors uh, at this stage are not actually registered with any medical or dental council or, or professional body. They might have their own body, I'm not aware of that. But these, these guys, it's literally, we throw the bones and we see what your disease is. It's, it's really a bit scary. And 70% of the country still believes in this. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. Um, our biggest problem that I've seen in, in our private practice is we tend to be a culture of only fix it when it's broken. And uh, what I enjoyed when I came to do some rotations here in Europe was to see that there's a lot of preventative medicine. People come once a year to come and see the, you know, they have a stapedotomy, they've come once a year just to check that everything's fine. I won't see another one of my stapedotomy patients unless it's seven years down, eight years down the line, when now suddenly the pistons come off or whatever. So um, unfortunately, it's a, it's, a, it's a culture of only fix it if it's broken. I just thought I'd put this pamphlet up. This gentleman practices 300 meters from my office. This is Dr. Hafidja. There's all the things that he can cure, and I've, I've circled that. Sorry, it, it came out with a little bit of light. It says, you will be surprised how your problems will be solved in two days, 100% guaranteed. It's very difficult to work against a guy like this because he is 100% guaranteed of his results. So why did South Africa have the edge in the 1967's first heart transplant? Those of you that don't know, we own that right. In Cape Town, we had a surgeon, Dr. Chris Barnard, who did the first ever heart transplant. So let me quickly just give you a story. It's a fascinating story. On the 20th of September, 1967, uh, Norman Shumway announced to the world, and these are three Americans that were in the race. It was Norman Shumway, uh, Robert uh, Lower, and Adrian Kantrovitz. And these gentlemen were really racing, well, not racing, but, but working to get together the first heart transplant. The anti-rejection drugs had come in and were in, under control in such a uh, way that they were now able to say that we are now looking to implanting or, or transplanting the first heart. That was uh, Robert Lauer, uh, sorry, Norman Shumway mentioned that. And now everybody was ready and they were waiting. And Adrian Kantrovich was actually the first surgeon with a patient waiting for, and he had a little six-year-old, uh, uh, sorry, a, a young child, it was a neonate, but they were waiting for an anencephalic donor at that stage so that they could use this little child's heart. And they were just sitting waiting. In South Africa, we, um, a guy by the name of Louis Washkansky was uh, cited as the donor or the recipient, and he was really, really waiting in Grutteskir Hospital in Cape Town. And now it was a case of, can we find the right donor? On the 22nd of November, 1967, a colored man had passed away in a motor vehicle accident. He was, a, he was 44. He was the perfect match. Everything was perfect. Chris Barnard was elated. We might win this race. hospital superintendent says, this is apartheid. We cannot put a black man's heart in a white man's body and cancel the procedure. Isn't that insane? And uh, made Barnard incredibly angry, but I mean, this, was, this is the situation of the country at that stage. Well, on the 3rd of December, 1967, a young white lady was knocked down in front of the hospital with her mom in a car accident, and she became our first heart transplant donor. And uh, the reason that that gentleman lived, well, he only lived 18 days, the recipient, and then, as you know, passed away, but the second heart transplant that Chris Barnard did lasted 18 months. Philip Bleiberg is his name. He was a dentist. And 
the reason that South Africa was able to get such good results is another political issue. In America, you were declared dead only after seven minutes at that stage. Your heart had to stop beating for seven minutes. In South Africa, you were declared dead when the doctor said you were dead. So this meant that South Africa was able to take a relatively fresh heart and transplant it while the Americans had to wait and obviously got you know, ischemic damage to that heart. So that was just a little bit of interesting facts of, of why South Africa managed to get into that first heart transplant. But man, we've got behind now. So our problem is education of autologists. We have a lot of legislation in the Department of Health. They freeze posts, then they suddenly open posts. Then uh, it, it's, it's, it's a bit crazy at the moment. Uh, we've got eight training institutions in South Africa where you can train as an ENT. That's only eight universities that actually you know, take on a registrar. We get about 10 registrars a year across the whole country. It's training, you know, 10, not 10 in total, but 10 per year. And obviously with the five, four and a half, five years, you've got about 50 in training at any one time. Unfortunately, there's a bit of a brain drain from our public sector. A lot of the uh, professors, a lot of the uh, skilled surgeons have moved into the private sector because it's much more, uh, much better remunerated. So we, we're losing a lot of skills in the public sector. Again, we've mentioned about HIV and head and neck cancers. Because that's the overwhelming majority of work, otology is seen as an absolute luxury. And of those eight universities, I probably can say there's only three university centers that have got good odological training in the whole country. Let's look at the next statement. There's no middle ear prosthesis available in the public sector. I am speaking now from our Johannesburg environment. I know there are some down in Cape Town. And um, recently, and, th and this fortunately has been rectified, we had 18 months in our Johannesburg main hospital with no operating microscope. Um, how do you train trainees with this situation? This is just depressing. So what, in, what it did do, however, is we did have a couple of functioning endoscopes, and it forced us to revert to endosco endoscopic ear surgery. And what I mean by that is, is in the private sector, I've got a microscope. In fact, I've got two in my theater. I've got endoscopes. I've got everything. So I can carry on. But when the trainees are trying to learn, we, how do we teach them when they don't even have a microscope? So some people don't even need a microscope. You can see Robert's not even looking through the, the uh, microscope there. Some guys like to use endoscopes. What uh, we've seen in the private practices is that a lot of us uh, in, the, in the privileged role of being in private practice have now mentored a lot of the trainees. They come to us at our private practices and attend surgery with us. The problem here is, is that as it's a private patient, we, we don't really allow them to work on these patients. It's medically legally a problem. So it's very difficult for them to get hands-on training. Um, although we've got sessions in the public sector, frustrating, you get there and then the list is canceled because there's no linen. Uh, which happened just the other day. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's a little bit irritating. So, by the way, what, the, what were those two guys looking at using the endoscopes? They were trying to find the ear of this little worm. Anyway, it's a, it's a South African worm worm. So in my private practice, that's what my waiting room looks like, so it's pretty okay. That's my little uh, consulting corner where I do my examination in my one side, and that's the, uh, where I'll use a little microscope, a little few little... So we, we, we're not, we haven't got nothing in our, in our practices. That's my theater setup. That's actually my wife operating with me. She's also a doctor. Uh, we do our cochlear implants together. And uh, so we've got a little... So we've, we've had to revert back to using incuses, and I know that it's not ideal, but that's, that's all that we were really given. Um, however, we, we had a visiting, uh, a lot of you know, Levant Sinaroglu from Turkey, a great guy, and he, he really helped us a lot. And, has been pushing this Ketakem cement that he uses a lot. I know it's a glass ionomer, and I'm not sure how it compares with Cerosim, but Odomimics in our country, the hydroxyapatite cement, hydroxyapatite cement costs the same as two and a half prostheses for one little bottle, and we can't obviously use it on more than one patient. So while the Ketakem we're able to use, I, I, I mean, I, I purchased this, and uh, we're able to use this on 50 patients before we need to get a new bottle, and this is really cheap. It's 1,000 Rand, which equivalates to about 70, 70 euros. Okay, so what, does have, what has improved is I forced myself to endoscopically operate just so that I can train the trainees. Uh, this is more difficult for those of you that do know that, I mean, really, stapedotomy endoscopically, is that really necessary? I know, I know David Potier and the, and the team and, and uh, Trebizini will be uh, upset because they do it with, a, with an endoscope. I have done it with an endoscope. I'll show you some cases now. But uh, um, it is challenging to only have one hand because I don't have an endoscope holder. I now use all my own equipment in theater. The reason is I have to bring it all from the private practice and, and, and go and operate there. Uh, our results have stayed quite stable, but I'd probably be honest, they're not ideal. This is an endoscopic stapedotomy. It's, it's, I've, I've put it on. It's one of the earlier ones, so it's not brilliant, and uh, it's just a quick summary of it. But um, 
this is what we have to now do in the, in the public sector. Well, we did. We now have a microscope working again. But yes, you get a very nice view. Uh, you know, sorry, I'm just going through some steps. It's just a, a quick removing of the superstructure removed, just an fenestration done there. And uh, the tricky thing is, is, think about this. You've only got one hand to do all this. Uh, so it, it's, not, it's not easy. Let's move on. One thing that's quite fun in private practices, we live in a trauma society, so this is how we use our remove a foreign body in South Africa, because if you don't cut, you can't charge. So this is how we remove foreign bodies in South Africa. Okay. Before you say anything, just wait. We don't have court, you can see. Oh, sorry, we do have court. <laughs> You'll see in a minute. This was a uh, police uh, policeman that came to see me and had this uh, bump behind his ear. And uh, yeah, that needed to come out. That's how we remove foreign bodies in South Africa. <laughs> Same, he was shot uh, in, in the line of duty through, uh, through the anterior part and, and got lodged in the mastoid. We saw this yesterday. This was just the endoscopic stapedotomy that uh, we used the ketocam cement for the revision. I'm not gonna show it to us again. But um, so without being negative about it, I just wanted to give you a bit of a picture of what it is in a third world country and how different it is from the first world country. We've got some fun things, and I'm, unfortunately I put the name on, but I, I wanted to know if anybody has seen one of these before. A uh, nice patent for Raymond of Hushka, and uh, every time she opens her mouth or her jaw, you get this little movement. I don't know if you've ever seen that. She has no symptoms, but it was just interesting. And then we've got this, unfortunately, which is a patient in a motor vehicle accident that I treated. And this is a different story altogether. Every time he opens his mouth, he gets an incredibly roaring noise in his ear. So look at that, you know, where the fracture has actually gone onto the tympanic membrane, and it moves it every time he opens and closes his mouth. So, uh, yeah, we've got some crazy things here. Well, our biggest challenge in South Africa is stay positive, even though it seems to be in a negative environment. Financially, we've got to be a little bit more tighter, and um, we need to be safer. Um, try to not keep your standards, or try to keep your standards up and be careful because you do have a bit of a carte blanche. In South Africa, medicine is not as well regulated as I see in, in some of the European countries. And so this gives you an opportunity to do whatever you like, but that's dangerous. And I, and I think one needs to really have integrity to make the right calls. And I keep saying, you know, someone's going to train the next generation of SAOtologists or my grandkids are not going to get good service. So if it can't be me, why not? I should, I should be stepping up. So don't just lie down. Get up and make a difference. We are actually in the private practice still trying to do research in very difficult circumstances in terms of time. So we've, I've got a little study going on with cochlear implants in HIV patients, or, or my team has actually. Um, we've, we've actually been, been able to do some single-sided partial deafness uh, studies and some CI patients. We've got a large cholesteatoma uh, study going, and now recently a new one to see how our glass ionomer cement is going to hold. As I've heard, it uh, possibly won't hold very long. But um, this is how uh, we've... Uh, the last way, the last video today is just to show you how we use, uh, usually clean our um, radical cavities. It's a lot easier. And uh, you can see the facial with the one guy down there is working on the facial, lowering the facial ridge. The other guys are just keeping a, um, keeping a good look out. This was a 65-year-old gentleman. He had, he had previous surgery numerous times, not by me. And he'd, uh, he came in, he said there was a tickle in his ear, but he, obviously he was deaf, so he couldn't hear anything in that ear. But he, isn't that insane, eh? Ugh. Okay, so that's how we clean cavities. Well, that's all from me. I hope this was just informative to let you know what happens in South Africa. <laughs> Absolutely fascinating, Dwayne. Uh, one of the things that happens in the UK is as, as, the, as the health service has reduced the tariff for what it pays for treatment, the okay. insurers tend to follow. So our main insurer at the moment, Bupa, or the biggest name, yes. has recently sent out an email <laughs> that from now on, you know, an audiological workup will be will attract a, a fee of 60, 65 euros. To which we're saying we can't get audiologists who are prepared to do it for that. Have you found that the insurers have started to drop their it's, remuneration as well? It's very interesting what you say there. So maybe they're trying to take my computer. Maybe you need to unplug. <laughs> okay. So um, the, uh, the problem with us is, is, is exactly that. We have a one big insurer, uh, just for the sake of being alive, I'm not going to name any names, but that insurer will, will, will sort of actually guide the government, strangely enough. So what we've seen now is 
the insurance is, is starting to pay for cochlear implants and, and a couple of other things they've just now allowed for bone bridge. But the problem here is, is that we, there's no connection. It's, it's so far the, the gap between private and public medicine that the, the public doesn't, they, they just employ the surgeon. They don't, there's, it's not a, the hospital doesn't have like you guys have where you've got a, a budget in terms of ENT can do X amount and they can spend so much on this. They just have somebody working in the public sector as an ENT, and, and so budget is, is, is not specifically departmentalised. Right, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm not ashamed to, to mention insurers in the UK because they're only sending these letters out, so it's in public domain anyway. Okay. Um, but, this, I mean, this is a great worry, is that yeah. it's detracting from offering patients the best medicine. Absolutely. And, I, you know, I don't know how we get around this problem because you can't stand up against these guys. You become a marred man. So you just have to do the best you can for your patients. Anybody else like to, to make any points? Uh, I mean, fascinating to hear what's happening in South Africa. Thanks, Wayne, for, for bringing the subject here. And uh, I'm quite sad uh, to, to see a South Africa standard of medicine as it is today. I, I sold a small Fiat 600. I took uh, a plane to Johannesburg 30 years ago. And I stayed in Baraguana for three years. Wow. And uh, the status of medicine at that time was outstanding. Yeah. Uh, there was no limitations for any budget for doing anything. Yep. I was not doing uh, ENT at that time, but I, I was doing some, uh, at first, my first job was neurosurgery. And, uh, and then I, were, I, and I shared Ward 9 in Baraguana with all those chaps. Yeah, we know Ward 9. Yes, and from ENT. So uh, I had a bit of a relation with people over there in, uh, in, the, in the ENT, and uh, uh, there was no limits for anything. The, it was a first world medicine yep. at that time. Yep. Uh, I learned a lot, and what I am today, I, I owe it to, to you people that uh, told me how to be in time, <laughs> how to work, when not asking anything. You, 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 you are the first one to, to be there and the last one to live. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I've, uh, I've seen there, well, uh, well you, you're speaking of trauma, probably uh, most of the people must know that uh, in one weekend from the end of the month, I was helping a friend of mine in, uh, on, on surgery pits and we have five step hacks. Sure. Five step five arts, step five step arts in, in 24 hours. Sure. So it's, it's amazing uh, what, uh, what happens there in the air. We have no, um, no idea what, what's, uh, what's going over there. Yeah. One thing that I was going to ask you is, uh, I've never seen a TV here. here. Okay. Over there, we, we went there quite often to drain abscess in yes. the brain from uh, uh, ENT, for, from tuberculosis in the ear. Is there still a problem over there? The I, I, I can't really speak that much for the public sector. I know my colleagues are seeing some TB in the air. Every now and again we have at our journal club presentations from the registrar's trainees and they'll present a case where, you know, there's a mastoid and it's just not getting better and they finally took a biopsy and came back as, you know, uh, gram-negative positive, well, gram-negative uh, bacilli and uh, positive for TB. And uh, what we have seen is, is those respond very well to medicine. Sometimes you do have to, you know, do an initial debridement, but the, medical, the medication for TB is actually the first-line treatment, not surgically. S obviously, if you've got an abscess in the brain, you've got to drain that. But uh, I, in my private practice, have only ever seen one TB in the, uh, in the mastoid. And that was a renal patient, immune compromised, uh, you know, that kind of patient. Okay, anybody else? Well, it's a really good session, and uh, I mean, the message that's come out of that, you know, don't bite the hand that feeds you, but we are, at the end of the day, the agent of our patients. We're not the agent of the government, and we are certainly not the agent of the insurers. And I hope a few patients are watching this. <laughs> we, you know, we want to look after our patients. We have to be sensible you know, and understand the financial constraints, but it just proves what can be done in a very difficult situation. Thanks, Wayne, for a very, very, very good presentation. Thank you.